So this is the Darling Marine Center. It is a remote field station uh, for the, the University of Maine at Orno. So it, it serves a lot of functions. Um, it supports undergraduate research. So the School of Marine Sciences has a semester by the sea. My name is Adam St. Gillet. I'm a researcher with the Aquaculture Research Institute at the University of Maine. I research seaweed and seaweed aquaculture. And I think seaweed is really cool as a crop because it doesn't require any land or water or fertilizer, and we can grow a lot of biomass very quickly, and they're just really cool creatures. My favorite seaweed to eat might be all of them. You know, it's, it's hard to pick one because the, as we grow more and more seaweed, I think we should all understand that growing seaweed isn't just something that happens in Maine. It has been grown across the world for a really long time and many other different species that we don't have here. And there are great products that come from those. There are ways that you're probably encountering seaweed in your life that you don't even know. So every night when you brush your teeth or on the weekend when you go out and get some special ice cream, there might be seaweed in those products and you don't even know you're eating them. So those might be my favorite because that's the best way to get a lot of seaweed into people's lives without them realizing they're eating it. But my personal favorite, this company, Atlantic Sea Farms, it makes a great kimchi, so it's a fermented seaweed salad. That one's my favorite. But I also really like yukuma, which is a tropical seaweed that's grown around the world. Uh, it makes really good shakes and salads. To grow baby seaweeds, we first need parents, just like anything. And the way that we do that right now, farming seaweed, is that we'll go out into the ocean around uh, late summer, early fall, and we'll go look for wild kelp beds and we'll look for blades of kelp that have what we call sorus tissue, which is the tissue that is ready to make new baby kelps. So we can bring those kelps back into the lab and we can make those kelps release what are called spores, which are kind of like the eggs for kelp, but they swim around in the ocean for about a day. And then they want to settle on something like kelp lives on the bottom of the ocean, right? So we create what are called spools, which are just some twine wrapped around a piece of pipe, a PVC pipe, and we get all of those spores to settle on that twine, and then we give them a happy environment. So we'll put them in a tank of water, we'll give them nutrients and light, just like plants need, and then in four to six weeks, we'll have tiny little baby kelps on that twine, and that twine around the spool is what we give to farmers to put out on their farms. It's called a photobioreactor. So what we're doing here is isolating and growing a very specific life stage of sugar kelp. So if we talk about the life cycle of sugar kelp while you're looking in here, most people when they think of kelp think of a kelp blade, sort of the giant lasagna noodle in the ocean. That's one life stage of sugar kelp. The other life stage is called a gametophyte, which stays microscopic. Um, and this is the stage where there are separate males and females. So at this stage, by isolating gametophytes and culturing them like this, we have the ability to cross specific strains and parents together to start developing and being able to understand how certain crosses will impact the amount of biomass that we get on the farm, what those kelps look like, how fast they grow, how thick they are, what's in them. It gives us uh, power to really start moving forward like true agriculture, right? And start doing some selective breeding like they've been doing with plants for millennia. So what these allow us to do, each of these containers is totally sealed. So it's sterile in there. I can put this whole thing in an autoclave. I can fill it with seawater and media. And then these are designed to be fully controllable and give these gametophytes everything they really need to be happy and healthy and grow vegetatively. And it's really cool, right? I mean, the whole thing is all connected together to this, by this brain thingy here. It's connected to the internet, it's connected to my phone, so I can pull this up and see exactly what's happening in all of my little chambers. So each of these little squares represents one of these individual bioreactors. They're all totally programmable and controllable. So if you click on this one, for example, this is showing us what the pH and the temperature, uh, and the stir speed of the bar in here, it's giving us light. I can change the light from red to blue to white. Um, which is all really important. So we grow them under red light. They will just continue to multiply uh, vegetatively. And then when we expose them to blue light, a uh, mix of blue and white light, that signals them to become reproductive and they start producing eggs and sperm 
that um, we can mix together. So I can, I can dial all of these components up and down. You can drain things off the bottom. It's a really powerful tool, not only for production, but for experimentation, because we've got 12 of these units here and they're relatively small volumes. So it's, it's very exciting. We're one of very few of these that exist currently. So we're really looking forward to, to what this is gonna do for, for the industry in Maine and, and beyond. So the reason we do this in a hatchery really is all about control. We want to make sure that we're growing just seaweed and nothing else. So one of the biggest thing you learn as a marine scientist is that when you put something in the ocean that doesn't have anything growing on it, everything in the ocean wants to live on that. So if we were to just put ropes out into the ocean and hope that kelp would settle on our line, we might get some kelp, but we'll probably also get a bunch of other organisms that want to live on that rope. So what we can do is give our baby kelps a head start by growing them in a hatchery in a nice contained area where we can make sure we're just growing kelp and they have got the best conditions that they need to grow as strong and as fast as they can before we put them in the ocean so that they can grow faster than everything else that's going to want to settle on that farm with them. So we don't have to maintain everything in the bioreactors. We can maintain cultures in much smaller quantities. So we can hold gametophytes in just these little 50 milliliter vials um, at fairly high densities. So if we keep them at the right temperature and give them the right amount of light, they'll be fairly happy in there growing fairly slowly. Um, and it's, the maintenance there is just to sort of change the media periodically and spread them out sometimes. But in theory, we can keep these in here as long as the power doesn't go out and this doesn't fail, <laughs> right? I know the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences has a fairly big library of gametophytes that was developed by some partners at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and University of Connecticut. They've done a lot of work there and have done a lot of legwork there, but we're hoping to start our own, our own library here based on kelps that we have right in our backyard. My hope is that these sort of systems, they may not look exactly like this because these are relatively small volume uh, and we have a lot of them and that's because we need what's called replication, uh, to do a lot of experimentation in different crosses. So probably fewer of these, but slightly larger, would allow you to create a lot of gametophyte biomass in a relatively small space. The next step we have to do is figure out the most efficient way to get those gametophytes either onto a spool or onto a farm and have them be as successful as possible. And that's some of the stuff that we're gonna be working out here uh, initially is trying to figure that out. We're really fortunate here at the Darling Center because we've got our research farm right in the same cove that the Darling Center is located on. It gets pretty warm, obviously too warm in the summer for kelp because kelp is a winter crop, um, but in the winter time it's plenty cold. But we have, this is a diversified research farm, so we have urchins and scallops and oysters and seaweed and clams and razor clams all in the same, the same space. So we can do a lot of different kinds of applied aquaculture research right here, which is really exciting. Our farm is not a typical farm because some of the work we also do is working on gear and trying to come up with better and more efficient ways to grow kelp. So this farm's not a typical setup. Typically, it's a long line system, which means we've got, similar to this, some moorings, and then in between those moorings and big buoys, there's a line that grows about two meters under the surface. And on that line is kelp. So kelp is basically, you can think of it kind of like a tissue conveyor belt. This is the end where the stipe is. The stipe is the, the skinny part. Stipe, lasagna udal. The part that attaches to the rock or to the line that you're farming on is called the holdfast. So this sort of spaghetti spindly looking thing. But the way kelp works is it grows in the winter time and it's sort of like a tissue conveyor belt. So the side where the stipe would be, this region of tissue is called the meristem. So this is where most of the growth happens for the kelp blade. So while the entirety of the kelp blade, stipe, everything, um, can photosynthesize, most of the active growth is in this region. So that means as the kelp blade gets longer, tissue that's down here is older, 
tissue that's up here is younger. So the way it works is as it adds tissue here, tissue will erode from the end, and those little bits of kelp float off into the ocean and become part of the ocean Sorry, food web and food system. One of the goals of, of the marine program is to, to get more students involved in this space. So hopefully uh, by the time you all are ready to go to college, um, there'll be even more students that are having experiences here.